please help me in welcoming Jacob Kovac. All right, hello everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Jacob Kovac. I run a small front-end development company that does a combo of uh, mobile and desktop apps uh, using Kibi and Python, and um, uh, web apps with React.js, which is not what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I also am a Kibi core developer where I focus on graphics programming, and I'm the developer of the Kivent game engine, which is a uh, entity component game engine built on top of Kibi. Um, let's see here. So, um, I guess we're gonna cover three major things here. We're gonna cover platforms, which really is about ensuring that your code will run everywhere, uh, even when it has compiled dependencies, because not all Python modules and not everything can be done purely in Python. Um, and also making sure that you can access system-specific functionality, because a lot of these different platforms have all kinds of things in them that you either, uh, you may want for your games or you may need. You know, oftentimes you might want to, you know, open a native file chooser or something like that so that you can uh, provide a simple, you know, user-friendly way for them to pick files out of their system or whatever. Uh, the second part of that is distribution, which is somewhat different from just getting your code to run on plat uh, an operating system. It's about getting your code to run on random people's computers who have done who knows what to them. And in general, I sort of have a very, uh, you've got to be distributing compiled binaries for the specific platform. There's no other way to do this. You can't trust anything else, and most other things are going to be, uh, especially for games, a little too much for your users who pretty much want to install an app and click go and play a game. They don't want to bother about package management or anything. Um, and finally, uh, performance, which uh, building games in Python has not really been all that popular uh, in large, or in at least a little bit because there is uh, performance problems writing everything in Python. It's not exactly the best for gaming. It, isn't really optimized for that, it's meant for other things. But we can get past that because of, um, Kivi is based heavily on Cython, which is a uh, sort of a uh, unholy union of C and Python all at the same time that is super sweet. I really like it and uh, it's the reason Kivi can work, it's the reason Kivi can be fast enough everywhere and uh, it's the reason the Kivent game engine uh, can do what it can do. Uh, so in addition, I guess I felt like I needed to justify a, bit, a little bit why Pygame, VizPy, Pyglet, um, your other favorite thing is not really, uh, why I had to build another game engine basically in Python and another way to do this. Um, part of it is that uh, the fundamental approach I'm taking is really heavily rooted in Cython and the thing with going in that direction is that for the optimizations to truly work you also want everything to be Cython or a lot of things to be Cython because as soon as you're falling back into hitting a different Python library or something else, you may not be able to, you may impose a lot of the penalties of Python lookups and attribute access and so on uh, because you're having to write shims between your code that you have written and taken care of to be nice efficiency, but who knows what other libraries do. Um, in addition, uh, I guess on desktop, there's also been some attempts to do this by using NumPy or something like that, which is a, a great approach. Uh, when I started Kivent, NumPy did not run on mobile. The Kivi guys have done a really great job of fixing that since then, but so I decided to avoid any heavy dependencies like NumPy. And in addition, I really think if you're trying to make Mario or Flappy Bird or something, you don't really need the entire scientific numerical analysis package. Um, uh, and in addition, some of these various frameworks have limited or no mobile compatibility, which I think building games in mobile is super fun. It's also, I think, the majority of devices out there now, so especially when I think of this, I, uh, oftentimes one of my biggest reasons for building the uh, Kivent was that we want children to learn to program, and we often teach programming via games. and. Most of the time, as students get older, they're probably gonna end up using some type of Python for something, whether it's research or whatever it is you do with the scientific stack of Python, I'm not really certain. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I wanted to make sure that kids could build games in Python, because that's gonna be one of the most useful languages for them going forward if they don't become professional computer programmers. Uh, I am very much 
in love with the idea of computer literacy becoming much more, or programming literacy becoming much more than a thing that the top 5% of the world does. Um, so yeah, uh, and in addition, some of these things require you to write your own event loop or make blit calls or flip buffer, or blit calls and flip buffers and all that kind of stuff. That's all really, really not a good, like that means that everybody has a bunch of spaghetti code where they've decided how to do all of these things for their unique project and I was hoping I could come up with a way to make it so we could all share the same basic low level event loops and flipping buffers and such so that we can share our code more readily instead of having to cobble together things sort of haphazardly. Um, and in addition, the Kivi framework is just wonderful. It's a much, it addresses all of these kind of problems I've just mentioned. Well, and it also provides a very powerful and simple API that has all kinds of cool things like replacements. Uh, the KV language is sort of a weird CSS that's super better than CSS and doesn't have any of its problems, um, at least from my opinion. <laughs> okay, um, so when it comes to platforms, uh, the Kivi ecosystem gives us um, several really great ways to uh, access these things. Uh, there are the PyObjects and PyGenius tools, which give you access to um, Objective-C and uh, Java code dynamically so that you can basically call anything. This is um, a, a much better approach in the long term than simply providing a nice wrapper for y'all to use based on what we think you want, because now you can use any part of the Android or iOS systems depending on what you need rather than having to wait for us to wrap it. Uh, in addition, Cython is a great tool here because it'll let you uh, call C or C++ code fairly transparently in your, your Python files, well, your Cython files. Um, and so between that, I mean, if you can get access to C, C++, Java, and Objective-C code, I think you pretty much have access to a good bit of the ecosystem out there beyond Python that is uh, related to game development. In addition, I did want to mention that uh, Kivi has a really cool project called Player, which is a platform independent compatibility layer, which aims to make it so that you don't have to individually wrap all of these features, and instead we've already done it so that you can just import gyroscope, and if there's a gyroscope on your platform, you'll get the gyroscope data, and if there's not, you will, uh, you'll get a not implemented error. Uh, and so, when it comes to making sure all of your dependencies work everywhere, there is um, basically two approaches. You can look for a library that's already been built to work everywhere, something like the SDL2, which is, prides itself on working on all desktop and mobile platforms. Uh, but sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you're working with various libraries based on, um, uh, you know, depending on the platform, uh, such as maybe interacting with the Windows API or the iOS API or something like that. And so uh, you sometimes need to find a solution that abstracts over those various uh, APIs to find a common ground that lets you transparently write Python to use those features. And Kivi provides um, really uh, very good tools for doing this and for really getting your hands dirty and being able to make use of the whole platform without it being too much of a pain. Um, so I just wanted to go give a quick example. This is the, um, from Player, this is the Java wrapper for uh, um, the gyroscope and uh, this is calling Java code. Almost everything in here is Java, and it doesn't really look like Java, I don't think, and it's definitely a lot better than actually uh, starting up Eclipse and writing some Java. And so, uh, I guess I don't really want to get in too in detail here. If you're really interested in this, check out Player, look at the code. Here's the Objective-C version, and notice that they're sort of very different because in the Android version of Gyroscope, you need to schedule a callback that's gonna get called, whereas in the Objective-C, you just hit the endpoint and check what the value is at that time. And so uh, th that's a great example of how like, any of these features could be implemented vastly different across platform. And so oftentimes a one-to-one -one conversion can be a little difficult to come up with, although not impossible. Um, and player uh, helps you do that. And this is what your code would look like if you were using the gyroscope in player. Wherever you wanted to start your code, you just call gyroscope enable. Wherever you wanted to, once you're done with the gyroscope, you call gyroscope disable. And you get the orientation. You no longer have to think about, you know, Objective-C, you no longer have to think about Java. And this is sort of the, uh, the dream of the uh, Kivi project's uh, view for player is that we will get to a point where you never think about wrapping Java or wrapping Objective-C. We will just have 
all of this ready for you and ready to go in Python, which I think is super neat. And Player also works for desktop platforms, although it's more developed for mobile because there's a lot more sensors and hardware that you actually want to query. And desktop Python actually has fairly established ways to get access to a lot of that stuff compared to mobile. Um, in addition, I wanted to mention briefly that you can also, uh, oftentimes when you're building games, you're going to be interacting with C libraries because that's where a lot of the uh, tools in game development is. This is uh, taken from Kivi's code for loading SVG files. And this is just an example of what Cython code looks like if you've never seen it before. Um, and this is for libtest2, which is a uh, triangulation library. And so something you may want in games because you deal with a lot of triangles there. Um, uh, so it, it's kind of ugly, but not super ugly. You've got some static types, things like that. Uh, it's, I like it because you can kind of start out by writing Python code, and then as you realize what you want to do, and also what parts of it are slow, you can conditionally convert that over to a, a kind of more C-like algorithm without really having to start over from scratch. Um, and so, let's see here. Uh, the real, Kivi is the key to how all of this works, in my opinion, because it, it really does ma manage almost all of these platform complexity problems. Not only does it provide a consistent API for abstracting over various windowing endpoint and uh, uh, windowing and uh, getting images loaded and sound loaded and uh, getting input from touch devices of all kinds, 2EO, MT Dev, uh, practically everything that's out there on the market. Um, it also is built in case you don't want something generic, but you have very, very specific use cases. Let's say you, FF Player is totally not useful for you in terms of your video pr um, displaying needs, but GStreamer is. Or you want to just target one specific operating system because you've got a very specific idea that's going to make use of Android or iOS or something. Kivi gives you a bit, the ability to configure it so that it, it works exactly the way you want with the providers you want rather than uh, just providing a single abstraction o over everything. So that uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility and that comes in really handy when you're doing things like uh, connecting, you know, the connect to a 50-inch uh, touchscreen and doing some kind of weird mall advertising display with liquor bottles or something. Uh, that's actually something one of our Kibi Core developers does and it's really cool. Uh, his company's name is Tangible Display and you should check it out if you want to see the type of things that uh, people are doing with Python and Kibi. Uh, and then, uh, I always think it's important to mention that Kivi is far more than just a GUI platform. It is uh, an ecosystem of uh, packaging, pack packaging tools, um, compatibility libraries, and uh, pretty much everything you need to get a really fully functional app deployed on Android. And so that gives you a very good starting point. For instance, these are all of the compiled libraries that you might commonly use in Python that are already ready for use on Android. Uh, these had to be patched or in some other way uh, given special compiler instructions to compile on Android, but the Kivi community has already taken care of that for you. Um, unfortunately, on iOS, these are the modules that work. Uh, we're significantly behind on iOS, um, and we do need more iOS and OSX developers. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. If you're interested in how this stuff works, come on by to the Kivi chat channel or our user group or whatever and get started. It's really, uh, we need help. I know a lot of you guys, a lot of programmers are uh, OSX people. Uh, the Kivi team are largely Ubuntu and Windows and you know Linux and Windows and so on, we, and Android. We, we're not really Apple people on account of Apple prices is what it really comes down to. <laughs> so uh, in, in terms of the packaging story, uh, I, we really have great, um, great news because just recently in the last few months, Python 3 support was added to Python for Android so that you can now build Python 2 and Python 3 applications with that tool. That's the Android new deployment target. Um, and it's also super neat because prior to this release, we were manually patching Python to make sure it would compile on Android. And we have instead switched to the Christax um, NDK replacement which uh, is much more compatible and works as expected, and so it actually just deploys Python 2 and Python 3 um, from their original source without any patches, which is a, a super big deal, I think, going forward for just not having all this weird random code that you need to apply to get it on Android. Um, and so Chris Dax is really cool. 
Uh, Kivi iOS is still only Pi 2. Once again, we're much further behind in the iOS world. And then finally, uh, at least for me, I use Pi Installer on desktop platforms because it's worked for me. There's several other things people could use. There's Nuitco, which is a C++ compiler thing that uh, I have heard from the Kivi some members of the Kivi community that they've managed to compile applications with that, so that's a way to go. There's also pi 2 exe pi 2 app, and CX-Freeze, so, uh, you know, you, you can get these in a couple ways. The, uh, but I think Pi Installer is the most consistent and the most supported for Python 2 and 3. Um, uh, the goal of the Kivi team eventually is to have one packaging to tool for all platforms. We've already started this. It's called Buildozer, and it currently has OS X, iOS, and Android support, so you have one spec file that manages to take care of all this complexity, and you basically just say to Buildozer, Android or build other um, iOS. And hopefully in the future, we will extend this to all desktop platforms. Um, we've mainly been focused on the ones where there's actually tools missing, which is iOS and Android. But uh, OSX was recently added to build other because we've got some, uh, or at least uh, the creator of Kivi, Tito, uh, Matthew Verbal, has some interesting ideas about how to deploy to OSX and make it better. Um, so. Let's get into kind of the meat of what I like to do, which is performance stuff. Um, this is, performance comes down to several things. One, it's, uh, and I mean, I think the most important for visual simulations is correctly using uh, graphics APIs. In this case, OpenGL is what Kibi likes to use. Because, uh, I mean, these GPUs have fantastic levels of power, and if we use them correctly, we don't even have to worry about Python being that slow because all the code's gonna be computed on the GPU, or at least a lot of the most intensive code is. Um, in addition, I, as I mentioned, Cython is a great tool for allowing us to interact with low-level APIs, such as OpenGL or a physics engine or whatever else it is you want to use it for, like spatial uh, hashing and so on. Um, and I will go over what I, the way I think Cython APIs should be built, because I have a sort of unique thing going on in the game engine where you're actually intended to either write Python code or Cython code that C imports, um, which is Cython's code word for importing C code rather than Python code, uh, so that you can avoid the call overhead. A lot, of, a lot of Cython libraries are sort of built to be one way used from Python, but there's actually a lot of power that can be gained from actually building an API that can also be used from Cython and to properly type everything. Not only do you get much better static typing, um, which can help with large code bases, but you also get a lot of speed. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about an entity component arch architecture because I'm sure a lot of you have never heard of it. Um, it's very popular in games nowadays. And finally, I'll introduce Kivent a little more fully. So um, really, in a lot of ways, this comes down to when we're working with visualizations, we're sending geometry to the GPU. That's all we're doing. And there's, there, there's basically two ways we can do this. Uh, the first way is sort of to send a flat array, like if we have a bunch of... Uh, like say we have an XY coordinate representing a 2D you know, position on the screen, we would send a whole bunch of floats in an array, uh, and then maybe we wanna have colors, and colors might be an unsigned character because that's a lot cheaper than a float to store. You can store the whole color in the same size as a single number, and OpenGL has really great support for converting those automatically to floating point numbers so that your math can work properly. Um, and right now, Kivi works by doing just that. So if you've got a bunch of floating point numbers, it throws them into an array. And if you've got a bunch of uh, whatever else you want, whatever other types, there's several in GL. It, you know, each one is unique. And that, that's useful from Python because it's much simpler. We can simply take a Python list of floats and parse it and turn it into an array. However, um, a lot of the time, you actually want to interleave your data types, and this is something that Kivent has brought to the Kivi um, engine, the graphics engine, is that you can now mix your floating point numbers and your unsigned characters into a single struct, which is much, uh, can be much better, I think, in terms of thinking about your code, because now you're no longer having to track several different arrays you're uploading and making sure they all get uploaded and have their memory allocated and everything. You can just allocate one giant array of a single struct that's all the data you need for your geometry. Um, and so, ultimately, the goal of any game engine is to make these arrays of your geometry and send them to the GPU and you get back what looks like a game. Um, and so, uh, this is one of the most performance intensive parts of games. You do it probably 60 times a second. Um, and it can take a little while. And so, um, Kivent has been built 
to minimize this time as much as possible. Okay, so um, I've said entity component architecture a few times without ever explaining myself. I'm, it is a method of compositing game objects instead of using object-oriented inheritance. Uh, and one of the best examples, I guess, uh, for why this is important is uh, you take something like, say you're building the Warcraft 2 game and you've, you know, you've got this little object hierarchy and you've got like a basic game object and then a movable game object that you turn into all your units and then like maybe a, a building object that is a game object that doesn't move and so on. Uh, and then you make an archer unit that's based off of the movable unit. And then you're like, but I want a, a tower that's like an archer, but it doesn't move. And uh, suddenly your whole carefully orchestrated, orchestrated uh, object-oriented thing has sort of got a wrench thrown in it because you want your tower to behave like an archer. You're either going to copy the code or you're going to try some funky multiple inheritance. It's much easier to simply split those up into a uh, component that governs whether something can move, a component that governs how it's rendered to the screen, a component that uh, governs whether it can shoot an arrow, and then if you want a tower, you simply add the shooting an arrow component to the building. And if you want, a, uh, if you want an invisible archer, you simply remove the rendering component. And this flattens out the structure of your game and makes it much easier for you ex to experiment with the code you've already written and come up with new features faster and more efficiently. Uh, in addition, it allows us to better consider performance optimizations because optimizations, each, um, each individual feature has been isolated so that we can turn it off, turn it on, uh, test how much time it's taking, so on and so forth, and reorganize the way it manages its data or whatever so that it works best for what needs to happen. And finally, it allows us to build game systems that can work together with minimal integration costs because I can go and write a physics system that will work for anybody's game without even knowing what your game is and as long as you, uh, I mean you can just throw it in your game and it's going to do what it was going to do uh, regardless of what else is in your game. Everything else doesn't matter, just, just the uh, very specific dependencies of an individual component. Uh, and so, Here's my first introduction to Kivent here. The number one thing, idea behind Kivent is that we need to take this uh, velocity component uh, Python object and turn it into a struct. And that's actually going to give you a huge amount of speed up if you follow this through, uh, hundreds to thousands of times faster. Because uh, if you're you know, looking up velocity on 10,000 different objects, uh, and you're looking it up in Python, that is a lot of lookup calls, and that's going to slow you down immensely. And so, um, now that we've turned it into a struct, the problem is you can no longer write from it from Python. Luckily, Cython does provide us with a really cool CDEF class that allows us to sort of write a bunch of ugly boilerplate that eventually allows you to interact with your new C struct in a way that, from Python, that is going to be um, uh, pretty transparent to the user. They're just going to, you know, hit vx here and vy, and it's, you know, just going to be object.vx and object.vy. And so, uh, Cython, uh, that's where I think Cython is better than, say, just writing a bunch of C or C++ code and then, uh, you know, using C types or something to link it together, is that uh, we have this ability to write some kind of Python, Cython shim here in the same language without really, um, with actually, I, I I'm not entirely certain on this, but probably less of an overhead than going through CFFI. Um, and so uh, to kind of continue this example, the original components update function would look like the one at the top, and the one below it is our new Cythonized update function. It's got, everything has been typed out and it's going to be much faster and it's pretty much a, a flat C loop at this point. And at no point does the actual uh, for loop there hit Python objects or go through Python anything. It's all C. And I really think one of the big things here is that when you use these entity component architectures, you have a lot of code reusability. This is why the Unity 3D engine is so big, is that they have split everything into little systems that do individual things so that they can go share them with each other or sell them to each other and do all the things so that you're not starting from scratch every time or struggling to integrate very different models. It's a, you know, we've agreed upon a, 
a, a way to set up the data, to store the data, and to initialize the game objects so that we can all share our work. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I hope maybe you'll go try to build some games with Kivi and Kivint in the near future. Uh, you can make them for all platforms. You uh, can worry less about low-level con uh, concerns. Uh, you will have a plan for when you, uh, something gets too slow for Python so that you, your game doesn't just stop in its tracks right there. And uh, you, you will have a much better organization, I think, than just spaghetti coding everything together. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, my favorite blog about entity component systems is the T-Machine blog. He has many articles written over the last like eight years about it. And then, of course, uh, Kivi and uh, Kivin's address there. Um, yeah, that's kind of my talk. Thank you. We have a few more minutes for questions. Well, great. I have remembered that can I have you, some. Can you please approach the microphone? Oh, sweet. I do have some demos I was going to show off here. This is Kvent start um, initializing game objects from Python. They're not being deleted. The counter at the bottom is the number of objects. You cannot do this in Python normally. <laughs> so uh, with your game engines, have you started looking into AR and VR applications? Can you speak up a little? I'm sorry, with your game engine, have you started looking into AR and VR applications? I have not looked into any AR or VR stuff yet. Um, not really something that's in Kibby's wheelhouse right now. We've mainly stuck in the 2D area. I'm still interested in, but have not started doing any 3D work. Thank you. So I missed the beginning. You might have uh, mentioned this already, but have you looked into PyPy on mobile devices yet? And if so, have you run into any particular challenges with that? I have not looked into it, but uh, from my perspective, one of the issues with the just-in-time uh, compilation method for apps like games and such is that oftentimes, particularly on mobile, your app may not run for more than two, three minutes, and that's not exactly um, JIT's wheelhouse, really. In addition, um, as soon as you switch to PyPy, you pretty much lose the entire Kibi ecosystem, so it's not exactly easy to just slot in a replacement since Kibi is so hooked into C and C-based things. So um, you mentioned uh, briefly uh, about the Unity engine. Uh, do you know if there's a way to um, use Python interface to actually call Unity uh, libraries or using the engine to develop games? Uh, can you repeat your question a little louder? Uh, you mentioned briefly about the Unity engine. I'm just wondering if there's a, a way to uh, use Python interface to um, like develop games using Unity engine. I am not certain on that. I'm sure there's a way, because with programming there's almost always a way, but I imagine it might be a little dirty knowing how annoying it is to interrupt just with C code or C++ code from C Sharp and Unity. It's not exactly fun. Okay. We don't have any further questions. Let's give Jacob a round of applause. Thank you all very much. <laughs>